This is FRM Part 2, Book 4, Liquidity and Treasury Risk Measurement and Management, and the chapter on Risk Management for Changing Interest Rates, Asset Liability Management, and Duration Techniques. This is another chapter written by Rose and Hudgens, uh, professors from Texas A&M and Old Dominion. The introduction of this chapter is very interesting. It provides clear goals about this decision-making process that is integrated and coordinated called asset liability management. So we'll spend about uh, half of the slide deck on ALM, and then we'll spend the rest of the slide deck talking about duration and some of its techniques. Uh, the thing I like most about this introduction is that it very clearly states that the purpose of this chapter is to provide an integrated approach to managing assets and liabilities and equity. So let's go ahead and look at the learning objectives. These are pretty general, discuss and describe. So there's asset liability management strategies. Um, of course, whenever we're talking about the right hand and left hand side of the balance sheet and we're talking about duration, we need to talk about interest sensitivity and we'll do uh, IS gap management. We'll also do some duration gap management and the very final slide, we'll talk about some limitations. So I would attach probably equal importance to each of these four learning objectives in terms of potential exam questions. So let's go ahead and start out like we do many, many times with, uh, with a good definition. What is ALM? Dynamic process. All right, dynamic means that interest rates change all the time. And we know that interest rates change all the time. And so we need to plan for the dynamic changes in interest rates. So planning and organizing and controlling assets and liabilities. And this means volume, mixes, maturities, yields, and costs. Uh, how about asset liability management goals? You know, what's the goal of any financial institution? Of course, maximize shareholder wealth. Well, how does a financial manager do this? Well, one way is to stabilize. You know, the textbook does use the word maximize as well. The bank's net interest income and its net interest margin. And there's that second circle point to maximize the value of the bank at an acceptable level of risk. Of course, the board of directors determines that uh, that acceptable level of risk. So look at the illustration that we have down at the bottom there. This is what I was saying just a few moments ago, managing the changes in interest rates, both from an asset perspective and a liability perspective. And so this is going to affect interest revenues, interest costs, and then market values which then leads into our net interest margin and then we'll compute net worth and then look over uh, the final the final block there on the bottom right the institution's investment value profitability and risk exposure so that swings right up to the second circle point maximize the value of the bank at an acceptable level of risk all right, in this slide, we'll focus on the top left of the balance sheet in the blue and then the top right of the balance sheet in, in light red. All right, the financial managers, managers, of course, have control of the composition of the bank's assets. But that also means that they need to make certain that uh, those assets are providing liquidity and earnings, right? What's the goal of the business? Maximize shareholder wealth. Well, you know, the accountants look at this and say, okay, well, let's, let's look at net income or earnings or earnings per share. As good financial managers, we know, of course, that uh, cash flow is way more important than whatever that historical earnings per share is, but that cash flow leads to contributions to liquidity. All right, so the manager then is going to exercise control over the allocation of incoming funds by, you ready, determining who gets the loans, right, and then setting the terms of those loans. And this is where banks have gotten in trouble uh, in the past by specializing in one type of loan or specializing in one term loan. Remember how we talked about the importance of diversification on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. How about over on the right hand side goal of liability management is to gain control over the bank's fund sources. So 
I always think of that right hand side as the source of funds, right? Deposits and all sorts of all sorts of things leading all, all the way down to uh, leading all the way down to shareholder equity. And those control levers are price and interest rates. We talked about those other terms applicable on deposits and borrowing to achieve some kind of desired volume and amounts and mixes and capital structure. Remember that right hand side of the balance sheet for just a regular corporation is called capital structure. I mean, of course, it's called that in financial institutions, but the problem of having such a small amount of equity and then a large amount of deposits makes capital structure unique to financial uh, institutions. Now, how about a funds management strategy combines both asset management strategy and liability management strategy? So I want to go back. Uh, I want to go back to this slide here. You know, financial institutions, if they focus just on the left hand side of the balance sheet, are going to have its own set of issues. And those who focus just on the right hand side of the balance sheet are going to have its own set of issues. And so from an historical perspective, the textbook does a fairly good job of identifying, you know, kind of the problems that we've talked about in many, many of these recordings. And so that's what this thing here is. A funds management strategy is uh, sometime in the relative recent past. We kind of combine all of those. And so look at that first circle point management to exercise as much control as possible to achieve the bank's goals. So they coordinate control over assets and its control over liabilities. Of course, they have to be internally consistent. And then uh, what's happening on the right hand side of the balance sheet is not independent of what is happening on the left hand side of the balance sheet. And they're not they're not pulling against each other. Look at the last arrow point recognizes that revenues and costs come from both sides of the bank's balance sheet. So this is just a reminder, I guess, of what we've talked about in multiple slide decks that, you know, you got this, uh, you know, you have the this big old umbrella here and all of these different business units. And inside of each of those business units, there's going to be, you know, some kind of a silo balance sheet. And so that's going to mean that accounts from both the left hand side and the right hand side are going to impact other financial statements. So how do we manage interest rate risk? Of course, when interest rates change, it would be nice if all interest rates changed by the same amount in the same direction. You know, this is called uh, a parallel shift in the yield curve. But of course, that doesn't ever happen. And so sometimes these shifts will affect liabilities more than they will affect assets and conversely as well. Look at that first uh, that first block point. Interest rate risk, the risk that shifting interest rates could adversely affect the bank's net interest margin and net worth. So there are two good formulas for net interest margin. Of course, I'm guessing that you probably know this from, uh, you know, things that we've talked about in the past but probably just general knowledge, interest revenue minus interest expense, and then net worth is the difference between market values. Interest rate risk, of course, two forms, the price risk, when interest rates rise, when the yields on a fixed income security rise, then the market value of that fixed income security falls. Um, and then the other side of this is when interest rates rise, then you can reinvest those coupons or any of the interest payments or intermediate payments at a higher interest rate. So you've got this balance of when interest rates rise, it's bad news for the value of the bond or the value of the asset. Uh, and it's good news for the reinvested terminal value because those cash flows can be reinvested at higher rates. So you have both of these things pooling, good news and bad news. And this sounds an awful lot like what you learned back in microeconomics 101, which I say to you guys all the time and I remind my children every decision, marginal cost, uh, marginal benefit. So look in the uh, look in the block at the bottom. So these uh, 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 ALM strategies, price risk, and reinvestment risk. Here's a summary of our two good formulas. There's net interest income at the top, interest revenues minus interest expense. But then we need to do this in a percent form. Let's call this the net interest margin. 
And so we'll be a little bit more specific in the numerator, interest income from loans and investments minus interest expense on deposits and other borrowed funds uh, divided by total earning assets. And remember that the firm has all sorts of assets, right? You know, they have land, first of all, that's probably not earning much. They have buildings uh, may, that may or may not be earning, but probably not. And they have some machinery that's probably not earning anything like a like a chair uh, uh, or a copy machine. Uh, but then there are other, other physical assets or depreciable assets that might be included in those to total earning assets. Let's go ahead and look through, you know, probably the simplest of all examples. 50 billion in total assets, 40 billion in earning assets from this Canadian bank. Uh, the bank has had five billion in interest income and half that in interest expense. Go ahead and calculate the uh, NII and the NIM, and so we can just quickly do that. Two and a half billion is the net interest income, and six and a quarter percent is the net interest margin. Now remember, those learning objectives don't say anything about compute or determine or derive or calculate, but clearly being able to see the math here helps uh, answer almost any kind of a question. Here's where it gets in more, a little bit more interesting in those learning objectives, this concept of gap management. And this is what I was saying just a few moments ago. We have interest sensitive assets and interest sensitive liabilities, of course, whose values are going to be impacted when interest rates move, but they're not going to be impacted by the same amount. So gap management, look at that second diamond point, refers to the analysis of the maturities and repricing opportunities associated with both interest rate uh, sensitive assets and liabilities. A definition of a repriceable asset or liability is one that just changes in value whenever interest rates change. And so look at the equation there at the bottom. Uh, the IS gap is the interest sensitive assets less the interest sensitive liabilities. And of course, uh, this can be positive, it can be negative, and it can be zero. Think about that. If the gap is zero, that essentially means that the financial institution doesn't really care whether interest rates go up or down because they're going to act uh, exactly offset each other. How often is that the case? Uh, probably not too often. Uh, here are some good examples here. Repriceable assets, short-term loans, variable rate loans, repriceable liabilities, money markets, uh, short-term savings, non-repriceable, so cash, long-term fixed, right? Long-term fixed buildings and equipment, non-repriceable liabilities, non-interest bearing demand deposits. You know, that brings up an interesting point, you know, here in the, uh, here in the fall of 2020, um, I, I get my statement for my uh, interest bearing accounts and the interest that I'm earning on all of my millions of dollars amounts to about zero. So I'm not sure if there's a difference these days in 2020 of a difference between non-interest bearing and interest bearing because interest rates are so low. Anyway, long-term saving and then equity and long-term debt, of course, that makes perfect sense. All right, how about if we take a look at um, a positive gap, and what that means for uh, interest rate changes. So we'll have a positive gap if there is an uh, when interest rates increase. So when I say interest rates, I mean yields as well. More assets reprice at the higher rates than the liabilities. Interest income increases more than interest expense. And so both of our metrics will increase. Therefore, that will increase the gap. When interest, when interest rates or yields fall, more assets reprice at the lower rates than the liabilities, then interest income decreases more than the interest expense does. And so uh, our two metrics both go down. And then just the opposite happens here for the liability sensitive issues. So if there's an interest rate and yield increase, more liabilities reprice at the higher rates than assets. So interest expense go up. So both of our metrics go down. And then when interest rates decrease, we have just the opposite case. So I'm gonna swing back to this one here. Uh, these are probably two good slides to just memorize if they don't make perfect sense to you. And I bet they make perfect sense to 
uh, lots of you. So here's that zero gap. When interest rates change in either direction, neither of our metrics change. Why? Because interest income and interest expense increase or decrease in the same amount. So this is what I was saying that earlier that they exactly offset each other. So look at the uh, light pink uh, box that we have down the bottom. A financial firm is said to be relatively insulated from uh, interest risk if its interest, sen interest sensitive assets are equal to the interest sensitive liabilities. How about some other gap concepts? How about a periodic gap? This one is not too terribly meaningful and it doesn't really have a whole lot of long-term applications, but this just tells us that whether more assets or lower liabilities can be repriced within a specific interval or over some maturity period, textbook calls that a maturity bucket. But the more important uh, gauge is the cumulative gap. And so this measures the sum of all those periodic gaps from time period zero to, you know, whatever interval we're looking at, you know, could be 30 days, could be a year, could be five years, right? And this is way more important because it directly measures that, uh, that interest rate sensitivity, the net interest rate sensitivity. Uh, relative gap, of course, is going to be some kind of a ratio, and the interest sensitivity ratio is going to be just the ratio of our assets over liabilities. And so let's go ahead and take a look at a quick example. Um, New York Bank reports interest-sensitive interest assets, 600 million interest-sensitive liabilities of 720. So let's go ahead and determine um, those couple of gaps and some ratios. So the dollar interest sensitive gap, uh, 600 minus 720, so that's easy math, right? Minus 120. So you do the relative gap, the 120 over the 600, that gives you a minus 0.2, and then the ratio is six over 72, so that's, uh, that's 80, that's 0.83. Look at the light pink box we have at the bottom. Regardless of which measure you use, the results should be consistent. Right. If you find a positive gap for dollar interest sensitive, then you should also find a positive relative interest sensitive gap, et cetera, et cetera. All right. How do we how do we kind of decide what uh, how to make this uh, asset liability management decision? So we, first of all, we need to we need to choose some kind of a time period. Second, we need to put some kind of a target. We learned all the way back in 1958 from Medigliani and Miller, we've talked about this at some point in our lives, about uh, capital structure and, uh, and when you relax some of their assumptions, there's an optimal capital structure. And so essentially what firms try to do is find some range of, of optimal debt in its capital structure. And this is really similar here. We need to pick a target uh, NIM, and this this has to be consistent with a couple of the decisions that we're making, right? So, what's the goal? You know, we want to try to increase that NIM, so we need to develop correct interest rate forecasts. Boy, we put that in bold. We should have put it in. We should have put it in red and maybe green and orange, and we should have been we should have been flashing it. You know, uh, Will Robinson, be aware, be aware. Uh, Boy, developed a correct interest rate forecast. Boy, if we could do that, uh, we could all be billionaires overnight. So that's really critical to make certain that we go through all of those econometric models, all the time series, and we worry about heteroscedasticity, and we worry about serial correlation. We worry about all that stuff. Okay, so develop a cor correct interest rate forecast. And then, of course, we need to be able to reallocate our assets and liabilities to increase that spread. How about the yellow, the learning objective that asks us to take a look at, whoops, to take a look at aggressive interest sensitive gap management. All right, so let's notice this table here. Down the left-hand column, we're gonna look at two different conditions, rising interest rates and falling interest rates. Of course, if interest rates are rising, the best gap position to be in is a positive uh, IS gap. 
Um, if interest rates are falling, then the best position is to be in a negative IS gap. And of course, the challenge embedded in this in this very simple table is to you know try to figure out okay when when are interest rates rising and when are interest rates falling. I mean, it's easy to look at the history and say okay, two days ago they were rising, and then yesterday they were rising, and today they are rising. But does that mean they're going to be rising tomorrow and next month and over the five years? That's why it's super important to go back to this one here and to rely on these econometric models to predict interest rates uh, accurately. All right, so that far right column is probably the uh, most important column in this aggressive management's most likely action. And so look at how this table is set up. Clearly, you can envision an exam question where they give you rising or falling interest rates, whether the gap is positive or ne negative, and then let's say, okay, what are we gonna do? Increase or decrease our assets or our liabilities? And so that right-hand column tells you those answers, and that should make perfect sense. about a weighted interest sensitive gap? This is fairly interesting um, because if you look at that first point, the, it's based on the premise that not all interest rate change at the same speed. Interest rates on bank assets may change more slowly than interest rates on liabilities. You know, back in your economics days, as an undergraduate, you learned about prices being sticky, right? You know, sticky prices. And so I, I never really heard the term sticky interest rates, uh, but this is, you know, kind of a similar uh, application here that sometimes on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, you know, they adjust like this. Sometimes on the left, on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, they go like that. And then sometimes they, hey, boy, can you snap your fingers and have it slowly? I don't know. I'm trying. All right. So what this type of a gap metric does is it weights based on their speed, which of course is sensitivity to some market interest rate. And so here, here are some good examples. Uh, Fed funds rate uh, has a weight of one. And so, it, you know, think of that as like the beta, you know, when you talk about uh, equity securities. And so some are going to have greater and some are going to have less than one. Here are the steps to determine this gap. We're gonna do some multiplying, we're gonna do some adding together, and then we're gonna determine, and uh, why don't we go through and look at an example here. So here's our, there's the left-hand side of our balance sheet at the top in green, there's the right-hand side of the balance sheet in the middle in red. So we have Fed funds loans, those are loans tied to the Fed funds rate, then government securities, and then loans and then interest-bearing deposits and money market borrowings, right? Notice the interest rate sensitivity weight. So federal fund loans, those are one, that makes sense. Government securities and loans, a little bit more speed of adjustment. Interest-bearing deposits, 86, and money market borrowings, 91. So that makes more sense that they're a little bit slower. So, you know, just think of this as the, you know, the tortoise and the hare. You know, some of these are really fast. Now, they're probably not as fast as a rabbit. Some of them are slow. They're probably not as slow as a turtle, but you get the point. Uh, and this is why I use the, uh, the analogy to the equity beta. And so go ahead and... Um, Multiply, so let's, let me just swing back here. Multiply the dollar amount of each type of asset by its weight. So that's what we're doing there. Dollar amounts time the weight. So that gets us all the way over to 75, 65 and 480. So we have a total of weighted dollars of 620 on the asset side, a total weighted dollars of liabilities, 349. So that weighted interest sensitive gap is 271. Now, of course, great exam questions include, all right, this is what we're trying to do. This is how we're going to do it. And then what kind of an obstacle are you going to run into? So what are these limitations? So interest paid on liabilities tend to move faster than interest rates earned on assets. That makes sense. Um, the interest rate attached to an asset or a liability do not move at the same speed as market interest rates. Okay, there's a good summary point. Uh, the point at which some assets and liabilities are repriced is sometimes easy to identify, but lots of times it's not. The interest se sensitive gap does not consider the impact of changing interest rates on the equity position. 
and the interest paid on liabilities fluctuates much faster. What that does then is that brings us to a conversation on duration. Now remember from your undergraduate investments class and then maybe a graduate MBA class where you talked about uh, interest rate risk, duration is a first derivative and then the second derivative is convexity, which was good news for you guys in this chapter. There's no mention of convexity here, but duration is uh, really another measure of the time to maturity. So let me just give you a quick example. If you, if you buy a 10-year bond, or you make a 10 year loan as a financial institution. How about if I ask the silly question, how long does it take for the loan to mature or for the bond to mature? And the answer is 10 years. So that's the, that's the time to maturity. But the time to maturity doesn't really give us a sense of what happens to things like the bond price and the terminal value of those reinvested coupons when interest rates go up or interest rates go down. So that brings in the specter of duration and convexity. I won't talk about convexity again. I'm just so used to using those, ter those terms in pairs. Uh, so look at, the, uh, look at some of those teardrop points. Duration is viewed as an effective time to maturity. It's actually a weighted average time to maturity. So if you have a 10 year bond and that bond has a 10% coupon rate, then the duration of that bond is going to be some time period less than 10 years. It's a way more descriptive measure of repricing opportunities than the maturity date of the contract. And at the risk of turning you completely off, there's the good old formula that's in every textbook that was ever written on interest rate risk. There's the formula for duration. And I'm going to just spend a brief time period here talking about it. Note there's a summation sign uh, in the numerator. What we're going to do is take the expected cash flow in each period. So let's just take a bond that pays $50 every year. So we're going to take 50 times 1, and then 50 times 2, and then 50 times 3. We're going to do all that. So we're multiplying cash flows times time. And then we're going to take the present value of it, of course, each time. There's that summation. And then we're going to divide by the current price of the bond. That's going to get us the duration of the bond. Now, in undergraduate and even graduate courses, um, I used to make students compute that. A lot of times I'd let them use Excel. Um, but in recent years, uh, with the uh, complete commonality of duration calculators and convexity calculators online, I pretty much let them just uh, just let them do that. But what I do is show them this particular example. And so, you know, looking at this formula, you might not get the true sense of what duration is. And this is what I have done here. So the top is a repeat, but I want you to look at the lower half of this slide. Consider a six-year bond that has a 5% coupon rate and a yield to maturity of 4%. So there, across that first row, I have the timeline. Let's just suppose that the coupon is paid annually, and we're doing this with a par value of $1,000. So look at the cash flows, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. You get uh, 5% of 1,000, so there's the $50 every year. And then, of course, the maturity payment at the end of year six. Take the present value of that using the super simple uh, bond pricing model from, I haven't shown you guys my calculator lately. So here's my calculator. Didn't you buy this from me from a forward contract multiple slides ago? So if you just enter that in the simple bond pricing um, calculator, you get 1052. All right, so what I wanna do now is I wanna just take you through a quick exercise. Let's suppose that and look i'm looking at the second excel spreadsheet there under let's suppose that we sell the bond at the end of year one two three four five and six and that's what the present value of the bond is so there's the 1044 the 1036 the 1027 so that's the present value of the remaining coupons plus the present value of the of the uh, par value of a thousand dollars so that first line is just potential future selling prices of the bond. 
Then I want to calculate the terminal or the future value of those coupon payments. So at the end of that first year, you get the $50. So that's $50, right? There's no time value of money. At the end of the second year, you get the second 50. So that gets you up to 100 plus you earned 4% on the 50. That's $2. So you go from 50 up to 102, then 156 all the way out to 331. So the total terminal value of the bond is the sum of those two pieces of the column for each year. All right, so I'm going to come back to that. So look up at the top. We're getting six $50 payments, right? So six times 50 is 300. We're getting our $1,000 back at the end of year six. So the total payments that we get, ignoring time value of money, is $1,300. Everybody get that. This is what the duration of the bond is. The duration is a weighted average time to maturity. It is how quickly are you going to get your $1,300 back considering things like time value of money. So look at the terminal value, uh, the terminal value along the bottom. So we go from 1094 to 1138. And then 1183, 1231, 1280, we're getting close to 1300. And then in year six, we get up to 1331. So the duration of this bond has to be somewhere between five and six. When do you get that 1300 back? And so the actual duration, and I give you a site for a bond duration calculator. That's just my favorite one that my students use. The duration of this bond is 5.3 years. So this should give you a better sense of what duration means. It's a weighted average time to majority. So a six-year bond with a 5% coupon and a yield of 4% has a duration of 5.3 years because it's at least five right in our columns and it's a little bit more than five. Now, you could, uh, I guess you could do some good old algebra and take the difference and uh, solve for that, uh, but you'll get about 5.3. Now, let's go ahead and use that formula, that equation, to compute the duration. So here's a, a loan to a customer since we're in a financial institution. 8% uh, a year, par value is 2,000 of the loan. Calculate the duration. So there's our... There's our 160, right? So 8% times 2,000 is 160 times the one, discounted back one period. And then 160 times the two, discounted back two periods. And then 160 times the three, discounted back three periods. And then the, the loan amount or the maturity value of the bond discounted back, also divided by the price of that loan, which is 2.8 years. Now, this is where I love teaching my students about duration because what you can do is that uh, you can use duration to try to figure out something that we've talked about during this entire slide deck. All right, so what is this? This chapter is called something like, okay, we've got assets and liabilities and interest rates changed. Now what do we have? One of the great applications of duration is that you can use it to determine the change in the value of a loan or the price of a bond when interest rates change. And so look at that top equation. So price sensitivity is equal to a minus duration. Of course, minus sign because when yields go up, uh, values go down. And so we're going to take a minus duration times the change in interest rate and present value there time uh, divided by uh, 1 plus i. And the pink uh, box at the bottom tells you a little bit more about the negative sign to the duration. Now here are two super simple uh, equations, duration of assets uh, and durations of liabilities portfolios. So these are just weighted averages. So the duration of the assets is going to be the weight in the first asset times the duration of the first asset and so on all the way up to n number of assets and the same thing applies over to the liabilities. Now how about a duration gap? What we want to know then of course is uh, what is the impact of an unexpected interest rate change on the market value of a bank owner's equity? In other words its net worth and this is what this uh, this is where the interest sensitive gap fails us because it doesn't measure the impact of those changing interest rates 
on the market value of the assets and the market value of the liability. So there's the duration gap. So we're just going to take the duration of the assets minus the duration of the liabilities, and then we're going to weight those duration um, by the capital structure, total liabilities over total assets. And here's where we're going to determine the change in the value of the firm's uh, net worth or its equity. So what we're going to do, we've got notice our equation up there. We've got some green. Those are for the assets. We've got some red. Those are for the liabilities. And all we're going to do is exactly. Hold on a second. All we're going to do is what do we do here? All the way there. So look at the very top of that. So we got the duration times the change in the interest rate. So let's come back down here. So there we go. Average duration of the asset. So that's the portfolio duration times the change in the interest rate. Um, present value, right? Uh, divide by one plus the original discount rate. And we'll multiply by total assets. And we do the same thing with the liabilities. And so there is in the gray box, the change in the net worth. So this is super important. Um, if I were creating exams, this one, there'd be 10 questions on this, uh, on this. So think about what we're trying to do here. All we're doing is taking, you know, the change in the asset value and the change in the uh, liability value based on our appropriate measure of interest rate risk, which is duration. That is so cool. All right, let's work through an example here. We've got, once again, assets in green at the top, liabilities in light red at the bottom. So we have some assets there down the left-hand column, and we have some liabilities there, including the equity. So there are some market values. Notice the market value of the asset 750 equals the market value of the liabilities 750. So there are the interest rate on the assets. There are the interest rates on the liabilities. Don't really worry about those uh, uh, absolute amounts. And there are durations over there on the far right column. And so what we're going to do is exactly what those previous slides suggest. Calculate average duration, calculate the gap, and then the change in the value. Boy, this is going to be so much fun mathematically. So let's go ahead and do the average duration of the assets. So where are we here? We've got 5.45 and 2.34 and 1.23. You know, what are you tempted to do? You're tempted to go back to kindergarten and just add those and divide by three, but you can't do that, right? You've got to, whoops, uh, you've got to measure them in relation to their weight. So you do that. You get 3.7 average duration of the assets, 2.7 for the average duration of the liabilities. Let's go ahead and compute the uh, Duration gap, so we're going to take the 3.7 minus the 2.7, and then we're just going to adjust it by the capital structure, liabilities over total assets, so 420 over 750. So that gives us a duration gap of 2.1 years. Now also take note that I'm referring to this as kind of a capital structure adjustment. The textbook calls it a leverage adjusted. Then part three, calculate the change in net worth. If interest rates for both liabilities and assets rise from seven to 10%, all right, this is a massive change. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a second. So there are our equations there. So all we're really doing is substituting in. Notice the numerator, the change from seven to 10%, that's in decimal form. So in the green, it's a plus 0.03. And then in red, it's a plus 0.03 in the numerator. And so change in the value um, of our equity is a minus 44.6. And so that's uh, 44,643 million if interest rates increase by three percentage points. Now, what I want you to do is take a deep breath and say, you know, th this is fairly straightforward mathematics. But if you're doing this, the reality of life is that there's no way you're not using an Excel spreadsheet and an interest rate tree. And so you're probably going to go up by, you know, not 0.03, but you might go up by 10 basis points and then 20 basis points and then 50 basis points, et cetera, et cetera. Because not only do you want to know what happens to a massive change in interest rates like 7 to 10, but you want to know what happens for minor daily changes in interest rates to the value of the firm. 
What we do know is that as you go from seven to 10, this estimate here of the change in net worth is much less accurate than if you go from seven to 7.1%. And so let's do that last uh, learning objective, limitations. Uh, hard to find liabilities and assets of the same duration. Of course, that makes sense. Uh, some liabilities and assets may fail to have a well-defined pattern of cash flows. Oh my gosh, thank heavens the chapter doesn't do this. What about if we have assets and liabilities that have embedded options like a call feature or a put feature or mortgage-backed security that has uh, refinancing possibilities in there? Then, then you need that big old interest rate tree. Uh, customer prepayments of loans, of course, distort anticipated cash flow. We talked about that. Um, there can be defaults. And this duration gap here, look at that last one, assumes that there is the existence of a linear relationship. So this means that we have a, we have a, what did I call this before? A parallel shift in interest rates. Notice that that 3% in our example was for both assets and liabilities over the entire spectrum of time. If we have a, uh, a non-parallel shift in interest rates, if we have some twisting, if we have some new shapes uh, to the yield curve, then we need to make certain that we uh, take some steps, but that's beyond this chapter. And I think that takes us through those four uh, learning objectives. Boy, this was way fun for me. I sure hope it was for you guys.